Well, this, as you will all realise, is something of a mischievous paper in some ways. It's probably the most self-exposed paper I've ever <laughs> written. And it's an experiment in a narrative style, born of the realisation that we don't have a language in which to speak meaningfully about birth. And I reiterate, because those who have the most intimate experience of birth have been excluded from the theological narrative almost from the beginning. And these voices are themselves being born as maternal voices. And I was fascinated to sort of realise that how differently we interpreted the brief, because it seemed to me that two of the papers were quite focused on birth from a maternal perspective and the others were more focused on birth from a child's perspective although um, in the context I think certainly in James's book which mm. we were invited to engage with a real serious endeavour to engage also with that maternal perspective so it's a kind of critical dialogue particularly with James's book but also with realising that this was asking of me to write about something that I haven't written about and that I couldn't theorise about and the more I was reading around maternal theories realising this was not a problem exclusive to me. Having been influenced very early in my academic research by Lucy Rigore and more recently having lost patience with her a little, I nevertheless am profoundly shaped by her insistence that in order to speak about these neglected and silenced aspects of the human condition, we need a morphology, we need a new way of talking. We can't just talk the same way about different things because what we're talking about is of its very nature, that which language in Western culture has sought to exclude. So um, I experimented with a certain style of writing and with a far greater degree of self-referentiality than I would normally be comfortable with. Indeed, I'm not comfortable with it, but here we go. Um, but also as an act of resistance just to the idea that one can do theology from anyone's experience, be it women's experience, men's experience, or anything else. The need to find a form of mediation, a shared language, and a way of speaking that recognises all experience is interpreted and inserted into culture. The problem is how do we insert the language of the maternal experience of birth into a culture which, as Irigure argues, has been shaped around the exclusion of that language. With that in mind, I wrote in a highly associative, quite intuitive style, allowing each of my own four experiences of birth to open up a different potential theological perspective. So the, the paper, funnily enough, echoing um, the paper we've just been discussing from Michael, is also divided into four parts. Um, a mother is born, birth one, in which I reflected on my own highly traumatic experience of childbirth with my first child. But in the context of the difficulty of explaining this, theorising, understanding of it, but also in the context of Sarah blaffer Hurdy, and I also don't know how quite we pronounce her name, some of the recent research on evolution, mothering, I was particularly interested in her concept of allo-mothering, as mothering as a shared activity among higher primates and her suggestion rather elusively that perhaps it's through this need to share the practice of mothering very vulnerable young primates, again the human in particular, that actually leads to bonds of altruism and love and the kind of evolutionary development associated with being human. And uh, at the end of the paper, I just suggest a potential Trinitarian theological analogy for that. Um, the second part of the paper I called Placental Mediations, Birth Two. And again, I based that on what was actually my last experience of birth, which was 
um, another deeply problematic pregnancy, but the idea of the placenta has begun to find its way into certain forms of theological discourse, evolutionary discourse, and I kind of did a riff on that by way of my own experience of uh, pregnancy complication and allowed that to lead into a reflection on maternal mortality and the very high cost to very many women of bearing children still in our world today and the caution against romanticizing birth in any shape or form without taking very seriously indeed the cost of birth to many women and of course the children who die with them. Um, and I had a little bit of fun there with a blogger called Mennonite. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also a reflection on the whole association of masculine fear and the female body and wanting to suggest that fear can be born of love as much as of hate, that we can fear to lose that which we love and maybe the sort of association between a certain masculine, for want of a better word, fear of the maternal body is, as James so well suggests and argues in his book, a, a rejection of the whole idea of being born with all its dependence, but also a fear that the child will kill the mother or the father will end up um, in a situation of being the mother to the child because the mother's dead, whatever. And I suggested a couple of um, examples from literature and film that suggest something about that. The third part, Mothers and Daughters, Birth Three, allowed me to reflect on birth can also be a positive experience and that led me into a reflection on the Virgin Birth and also the mother of the Virgin Mary, Christ's grandmother, St Anne, um, and wanting to defend the idea of the Virgin Birth but perhaps to rescue it from some of its more negative associations, again, with reference to some of the points that James makes in his book. And Redeeming Birth, Birth 4, allowed me to focus on my um, third child, my second son, who was in fact born on Boxing Day, and therefore a Christmas association between God's gift to us of a child and a birth that felt good and went well. Um, and bringing in then the theological perspective of what does it mean for childbirth to be redeemed as well as redeeming. I didn't bring in there, although it was in my mind, that enigmatic phrase somewhere in Paul that says um, women will be redeemed by childbirth, but I would now want to consider who is giving birth, because I looked at those rather strange examples of medieval art which has fascinated me for many years and wanted to suggest that perhaps we can see in the crucified body of Christ the coming together of male and female, mother and father, of the human in the relationships that were in some sense alienated and violently torn apart through whatever we understand by original sin um, so that the body of Christ becomes polymorphous, self fertilizing and gives birth to the maternal church wherein the sacramental life of Christ becomes the maternal nourishment of the faithful and I didn't go into this because I'd already written more than enough but lots of medieval images where Mary breastfeeding Christ is a metaphor for the Eucharist and I would want to push on when I develop this to consider all those images of birth and maternal nurture in the context of the maternal church and the nourishment of the human.